Okay, everybody, please take your seats. We're about to get started. Okay, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, so we are now going to have a session with two speakers who are going to provide an introduction to taxation for us. And like we did last time, in between the speakers, there's going to be a few minutes to reflect. So um, you can also use your yellow and red cards in this session. Uh, so yellow is if you would like a speaker to slow down. Please raise your red card if you would like a speaker to repeat or clarify what they've just said. So first of all, I'm going to invite up David Phillips. David. <laughs> so um, David Phillips is a senior economist and associate director at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, or the IFS, and he works on taxation and devolution. So the Institute for Fiscal Studies is a leading UK think tank and independent research centre on tax, government spending and related policy issues. So David in this session is going to cover what the different kinds of taxes are, how theory and evidence can help us think about how to raise more tax revenue and raise revenue in a better way, and also what we can learn from other countries' tax systems. So David, over to you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, can I first say how much uh, of a pleasure it is to be here as you undertake this really important endeavour. I think it's fantastic that you guys are all interested in, in learning more about this, and I hope that it's informative over the next, you know, 15 minutes or so. And second, can I just offer a little apology? Um, the slides on screen differ very slightly from the ones you're going to have in the little handouts uh, in the next, uh, when you have a breakout session. I made a couple of last-minute changes um, after they printed them. But they're, they're basically the same, so don't worry too much. And um, what I'll be doing in the next 50 minutes or so is giving a little introduction to tax, if you like, um, a primer. And I wanted to start by talking about or reminding you of the many different kinds of tax that we pay. The biggest chunk are taxes on income and earnings. That's income tax and the national insurance that employees and employers pay on wages. And that makes about 40% of the taxes we uh, raise. The next biggest chunk is taxes on sales. And that's mainly VAT on things you buy in shops, in restaurants, uh, other places. That's about 20% or so. And then there are taxes on land and property. So that's like the council tax you pay to your council and the business rates uh, that businesses pay on their property. And together, these three broad areas of tax raise about three quarters of the revenue um, the government collects. That's both in the UK and in Scotland, it's about three quarters. Then there are so-called green taxes, so taxes on polluting items. Uh, the biggest here is uh, fuel duties uh, on petrol and diesel. And I think that's quite interesting because, of course, there's a big move towards you know, electric cars. And there's a question about how do you replace that revenue when the revenue you company get on fuel disappears. There's taxes on business profits, on the profits of incorporated businesses. And then there's a, a range of smaller taxes, so taxes on alcohol and tobacco, uh, taxes on um, wealth, um, and uh, several other smaller tax areas. Now, of course, these taxes are written in law, but they're not set in stone. So what I wanted to do is give you some tools, some sort of um, insights to help think about some big questions I think you'll be facing um, in this assembly. So... Could the taxes we collect be raised in a better way? Is there a more efficient, uh, fairer way to do this? And if we think we need to raise more tax, spend on public services or to do redistribution, how could we go about doing this? And I won't tell you what to do. I'm not going to say what my plan is for the tax system, although I, I do have one. Um, <laughs> it's 700 pages long uh, in, in very small font. So anyone wants it, I've got it for you. But what I will do is look at lessons from economics and what other countries do to see what we can learn there about how I want to approach uh, tax uh, in Scotland and uh, potentially in the rest of the UK. Um, but we all need a bit of help from our friends. So I'd like to meet this man. Um, this is Sir, Sir Jim Murleys, um, the great, uh, unfortunately late, Scottish economist and Nobel Prize winner. And he worked with my uh, place of work, the IFS, on a big review of the tax system about 10 years ago. And actually, I say it's my 700-page plan. It's not. It's, it's his 700-page plan. Um, but I like it as well. But he put together a big review of the system, um, setting out in detail what he thought needed to be done. 
But here, I didn't want to kind of go in, into detail on that. What I wanted to do is talk about one of the sort of powerful sort of phrases he used to describe what he thought and what economists think a good tax system should look like. And he said it should be a progressive, neutral tax system. Now, what does that mean? Well, each of these three words is important, so I'll go through them in turn. So the first word, progressive, what does that mean? Well, it means a tax system where the rich pay a bigger share of their income or their consumption, their spending, in tax than the poor. So do we have a progressive tax system in the UK? So to look at this, I'm putting a little graph on, on screen. And what I do here is I put households, put households into 10 equal-sized groups with the poorest group on the left and the richest group on the right, and then look at the share of their take-home income that they pay in tax. And I first look at direct taxes. That's taxes on income and earnings and council tax. And you can see we have a pretty progressive system. The poorest groups pay about 20% of their income in tax. The richest group, about 60%. If you focus on indirect taxes, so that's VAT, uh, fuel duty, alcohol and tobacco, you can see it's broadly sort of constant across the distribution. So it's not progressive, but it's not regressive. Now, of course, some of this money goes to pay for public services, but some of it also comes back to households directly in the form of benefits and pensions. So this next line shows how much those benefits and pensions are as a percentage of incomes. So you can see the poorest group, about 60% of their income comes from benefits and pensions. The richest group, just a couple of percent. So what do you take away from this graph? Well, we do have a pretty progressive tax and benefit system that takes quite a lot from the rich and gives quite a lot to the poor. So the question isn't really, should we have a progressive tax system? It's the degree of progressivity. Do you think this is the right degree? Or should we go further? Should we take more from the rich to pay for public services and to give to poor people? Or has it gone too far? Has it gone from Robin Hood to, to plain thieving? So that's a question that is partly about values and for you as a group to think about. Um, it's not the role of economists to say actually how much we take from different groups. It's a political decision. So it's partly about your values. And it's also about trade-offs as well. Because of course, the more you take from rich people to give to poor people, there can be somewhat of a weaker incentive to try to climb your way up the income ladder. So it's about values, but it's also thinking about incentives as well. And I think one thing that you'll have to do is think about how do you trade off these two things? You might want to raise more money to redistribute more to help poor people, but can it go too far and then you end up actually reducing the incentives we will have to work? That's the kind of key question for you to think about, I think, in this group. The second word, neutral, what does that mean? What Jim means by a neutral tax system is taxing different things, taxing similar things at the same rate, unless there's a good reason to tax them differently. So for example, if you've got people working as an employee for a company, or people being self-employed, or setting up their own little business, they should face the same tax rates, so that it's fair for different people, and you're not distorting the decisions they make about what to do, whether to be an employee or to set up their own business. It doesn't mean never have differences in taxes. So it can be good reasons to have different taxes for different things. So for example, if there are goods or items that have bad things attached to them, like cost to wider society, so pollution or problem drinking or smoking, maybe you want to tax those higher. If there are things that have benefits to wider society, um, I don't know, basic research on medicines and health, maybe you want to subsidize or have lower taxes on them. But you need to think carefully about that it should be neutral as a benchmark. Don't introduce these distortions unless there's a good reason, because otherwise all you're doing is making it more complicated and giving more opportunity for people to avoid taxes by changing their behavior. And that links to the last point, he said. It should be a system, and I think this is the most important point. Taxes don't exist in isolation. They're part of a system with different taxes and a system where the money gets spent by the government. And I think that has two implications that are worth thinking about. The first is, not all taxes have to do everything. Not every tax has to be green. Not every tax has to be progressive. What matters is that the system as a whole is green and progressive. Different taxes have different purposes. So a tax on cigarettes, for example, actually costs poor people a lot more because poor people are more likely to smoke. But we think tax on cigarettes is a good thing to do because of the harms associated with cigarettes, the fact they're addictive. But 
the system as a whole is still progressive and it's still green, so that's not a problem. So think about it as a whole. And secondly, think about how the different parts fit together, because when different parts of the tax system aren't designed well, and they don't fit together, you get problems. And I want to show you a graph which, again, shows these problems in action. So this graph is going to show, for someone, for a job uh, that generates £40,000 a year's worth of income, how much tax you get if you are an employee, if you're self-employed, or you set yourself up as a little, small, incorporated business. So as an employee, you'd pay income tax, you'd pay some national insurance, and your employer would pay some national insurance. If you're self-employed, you pay some income tax, and you pay a lower rate of national insurance. And if you set up a little company, well, the company will be corporate tax, and you'll pay some tax on the dividends you take out. But you can see there's a big difference in the amount of tax you pay. If you're an employee, you pay, face taxes of about 11 and a half, well, 11,800 pounds on your income. As your uh, little company, more like 7,500 pounds, a difference of, difference of about 4,500 pounds a year in the amount of tax you pay. Now, that raises questions of fairness. And you're probably also unsurprised to find out that lots of people are now setting up little businesses to take advantage of the lower tax rates you have there. And that can open up some, some problems in thinking about, you know, how do we raise revenues if a lot of the revenues are disappearing as people are taking advantage of this sort of loophole, if you like, in the tax system. And I wanted to say that people really do uh, respond to taxes. It's pretty good evidence that people's behavior is affected um, by the tax system. So this graph is a different example, but I just wanted to show you to see so a real thing that's worth bearing in mind. So this graph looks at the amount of income that people with top incomes, the incomes are above £150,000 a year, how much they declare to the tax man between 2007-8 and 2011-12. And I'm going to show you it setting it all to 100 in 2007-8 so you can look at the trends from then on. And why am I doing this? Well, the reason I'm doing this is because uh, the government, the UK government, announced that they were going to have a new higher rate of tax if you earn more than £150,000. They announced that in uh, sort of late 2008, and it was coming into effect in 2010. And what happened to these incomes? Two sorts of incomes I'm going to show you. Dividend income that people get from their businesses, and the income people get from the employment, so from jobs. And dividend income, you can see, look, it's this big massive spike. People took all the income out of their companies before the tax come in, and it drops off a cliff afterwards. Employees, eh, maybe a little bit of an effect, but not much. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, I'm showing you is to show you that people do, if they have the opportunity, change how they behave to try to reduce their tax bills. And that's important to think about when thinking about how much should we tax, who should we tax, and how should we tax them? Because it's much easier, for example, if you own a small business, to keep the money in the company, take it out, shift the money around over time. It's a lot harder for an employee to get your, your, your boss to pay you in advance. So how people respond to tax is an important thing to think about when designing the tax system. And just some rules of thumb about how people respond, what evidence McConnell economics has kind of shown us. So the first is it's much easier to shift profits than it is to shift property. So, for example, corporate profits, it's quite easy, unfortunately, for businesses to shift their profits around the world and say, actually, this money comes from, you know, the, 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 the Cayman Islands than, than it comes from Scotland. Um, it's a lot harder to kind of pick up your house and move it to the Cayman Islands, um, unless you have a boat. Um, but that might mean that if you're looking to tax people with high incomes, maybe it's the property is an easier way to tax them rather than the profits, which they can kind of shift around the world. This is, might seem like a bit of a sort of, you know, obvious point, but it's more likely to respond when it's easy to. So again, if you have systems with lots of loopholes where different, different types of income are treated in different ways, you're giving lots of opportunity for people to change their behaviour to reduce their tax. That's a bad idea. The rich and poor respond more to tax than middle earners. So uh, it looks like low-income people, they're quite responsive on moving in and out of work. So when someone's got a low income, maybe you don't want to tax them too highly on that income because that, that will discourage them from working. Rich people are also quite responsive. That's not deciding how much to work. Usually it's 
paying more into a pension or, or changing their affairs to reduce their tax bills. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't tax the poor and you shouldn't tax the rich again. No, it should all go in the middle. That's not what I'm saying. But it means you need to think about this. Think about how you can design systems that try to, try to reduce these, these things. And people around the time are more responsive, as are mothers with young children. Now, I've been going quite slowly in my presentations. So I need to speed up for these last uh, sections here, unfortunately. Uh, another key point that I think is really worth taking away is that who's made, up, made worse off by tax is not always who is legally paying it. So um, businesses, for example, don't really pay tax. People do. So whilst businesses might be responsible for paying taxes over to the tax man, it's never actually them that's made worse off. Businesses are just a, a conduit. Ultimately, behind every business are real people. There's the employees, there's the shareholders, there's the customers. And it's one of those that's made off worse off by a tax. So in thinking about taxes, don't think that, well, putting more tax on business means it's a free lunch. It means you need to think about who is ultimately going to be affected by those taxes. Do you think it'll be the workers? Do you think it'll be the, the shareholders? And there's quite strong evidence that people, if they can, do shift the taxes onto other people. So property taxes, taxes like council tax, even though it's a person that lives in the property that pays it, that might not be the owner, it looks like what happens is that prices of properties, rents come down when you put council tax on the property, so it's the owner that ends up paying it. Taxes on employers probably get at least partly shifted onto workers, and taxes on business probably get at least partly shifted onto workers too. But this does take some time. So if you're concerned about a real short-term problem, sometimes actually giving a tax cut to workers or to businesses, it'll help them in the short term, even if eventually that tax has shifted on. So you can do things uh, to help people in the short term. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about really quite quickly now is what can we learn from how other Western European countries raise taxes? So I think this is something you'll hear about more in some of the later presentations. So this graph shows the percentage of national income we get in tax in the UK, in Western Europe, and in Scandinavia. And you can see in the UK, we get about 33% of our national income in tax. In the EU, it's about 39%. And in Scandinavia, about 43%. So we're quite low tax compared to most of our nearest neighbours in Europe. Although we're not low tax compared to the whole world. So, for example, other English-speaking countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, often tax less than us. What you tend to find in the UK is we sit in between Europe and these other English-speaking countries, and depending on whether you have a Conservative Prime Minister or a Labour Prime Minister, we move back and forth a little bit between Europe and between America on our levels of taxation. But just looking quickly at what Europe does, where do they get their extra revenues? So this graph splits the revenues up into different ports, different, sorry, different portions. We've got income tax and the sort of national insurance contributions that are paid on earnings, those two bottom bits there. And you can see that's where the difference comes from. The extra tax in Europe comes from higher taxes from income and on earnings. The other taxes, the top bit there, are broadly the same. And I think the key point to take from this is that this graph, oh, no, I'll bring them all up now. Two graphs here show the amount of taxes taken from top earners and from average earners in these two countries. And you can see on the top graph, the difference between what we get in the UK and these ta countries that tax more isn't that big. They raise a bit more from the top earners than we do, but not much more. Where the big difference is in countries that raise more tax is they tend to get a lot more from middle earners, people on typical middle incomes. Um, that doesn't mean we'd have to follow the same approach if we wanted to raise more taxes in this country, but it does mean that given other countries don't seem to be getting more from the incomes of top uh, earners, um, at least through employment, we need to look at other ways to get more revenues potentially from richer people if you wanted to. So things like wealth and property, rather than just focusing on the top rates of income tax. So I can't do this slide, unfortunately, but this has been covered by um, the next speaker. So to summarize very, very quickly, um, what kind of key messages I want you to take from my presentation? Well, firstly, that people and businesses try to reduce their tax bills if they can. People do respond to the tax system. So you can try to limit that by designing a tax system which tries to reduce those opportunities as much as possible. 
Don't give these loopholes to people. Secondly, real people pay all taxes. Business is just a conduit. You can't kind of put taxes on business and, and treat it as a free lunch. Who ultimately pays the tax is not always the same who hands the check over. Think about, do I think this tax will actually be paid by the employer, by the business, or will it end up affecting the workers down the line? Many other countries do raise more tax, but much of it comes from average earners. And if you want to raise more revenues from the top, there are other ways of doing it rather than just income tax. You can think of other bits of the tax system we could, we could improve, so taxes on property, taxes on wealth, um, taxes on pollution, things like that. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, David. Okay, so now we're just going to reflect a bit on what we've heard for the next couple of minutes, and then we'll be back to hear from Charlotte. Everybody, 
Right, bring you all back together, please. Excellent. Okay, so I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Charlotte Barber, from um, the, Char the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. So Charlotte is the Director of Taxation at the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. It's also called ICAS, and it's also on the Council of the Chartered Institute of Taxation. So ICAS, if you don't know it, it's a professional and representative body for its members. So in Charlotte's talk, uh, she will cover the tax system in and for Scotland, both devolved and reserved powers, uh, taxes, sorry, the cross-border issues and different choices made at UK and Scottish levels, and finally, the importance of better public understanding of the taxes package. So Charlotte, if I welcome you up, please. That's fine, I'll press okay. the button, yep, leave it with me, no Let's bother at all. Oh, it? Oh. Jolly good. Well, Smashed away, sorry about that folks. Uh, first off, thank you ever so much for having me, I've been here all day and it's a real pleasure to be part of your interesting conversation. Uh, it, it's great to be here and, and thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you noted, I'm a chartered accountant, I'm a chartered tax advisor, uh, and so what you might well say, uh, but parking that to one side, I guess where I'm interested in tax is how we'd advise people, how the individual sees tax. I guess for a chartered accountant, in the main, we tend to look at the taxes that individuals are affected by, so income tax, business taxes, VAT, uh, and I'll come back to those in a moment. So how do we see them? And of course, you tend to go to your accountant in order, well, to make sure that you pay the right amount at the right time. And that includes using reliefs. It also means that you probably, as David has eloquently said, that you probably don't want to pay more than you have to. Uh, and we all know that kind of collectively tax is a good thing, but equally for the individual, tax is often a cost particularly for businesses, it's a cost that has to be managed like the electricity bill or the wages bill. Uh, and so one needs to be mindful about how people will respond on an individual basis. So what I would like to talk to you about just now is kind of my view of taxes. And I would like to give you a bit of background about the UK taxes, because here in Scotland, in the last few years, we've had quite an intricate package of taxes because we are a part of the UK, we pay UK taxes on quite a lot of fronts, and we also have Scottish taxes, and those have changed over the past few years as to the package of powers that we have, and the nature of the powers differs depending which tax you're looking at. So some of the levers can be a bit complicated, and how some of those levers interact with one another can also be quite interesting. So I'll mention those various points and some of the choices and perhaps some of the constraints that we need to think about as well. And before doing, I'll finish off too by just mentioning a wee bit about tax education, uh, uh, see where we get to with that one. So first off, oh, that's me, you don't need anything on that. Uh, looking at the UK taxes, I wanted just to touch base and kind of come back to what some of your other speakers have said already. This slide is looking at 2017-18. You might say, why have I gone back there? Uh, I've gone back there because that's the last full outturn we've got. That's the last kind of absolute set of figures. And as I say, I've honed in on the taxes that accountants and business people and individuals tend to think of as interesting. A lot of the other taxes that, that both the Davids were talking about are a bit more hidden. You don't really notice fuel duty. You just shove petrol in your car, don't you, and kind of keep going. Whereas these are the ones that are a bit more visible because they either come off your wages or you have to pay capital gains tax or you have to buy, pay taxes when you're paying for property. Now these taxes, the three really big ones which we've discussed already are income tax, that's a UK-wide tax, and I'll come back to that in a minute because you've got Scottish income tax but it's actually a UK tax with Scottish rates. So in terms of income tax, the, the fundamentals, the what are you taxing, how are you taxing it, who pays it and how it's paid all sits on UK legislation. <coughs> income tax, it is what it says it is. What's income? It's my salary. Uh, if it was Charlotte Barber Chartered Accountant business, it would be my personal income, self-employed income if I worked that way. 
Uh, it could be rentals, if I had flats and let them out, say. It might be interest on my bank account. That's all income. The nature of it, uh, you don't have to get it every year from now on in, but it's kind of annual in nature. It comes in each year. It's also charged on pensions. Pensions are just delayed income, by the way, in, in, from a tax point of view. So we've got that national insurance. You may well say, is that or isn't that a tax? If I speak to my mum, absolutely not. It's her stamp, it's her insurance. It paid for her pension. Uh, if I speak to my daughters, they just think it's money that's been whacked off their salary and it's all part of payroll taxes. For my money, personal opinion, it's a tax, full stop. Uh, VAT, value added tax. Came in in 1973, replaced purchase tax. Uh, it's European to that extent. Don't get any bright ideas about it going as we go Brexiting. It'll still be there. Uh, for some, I think it's the very annoying tax. It's certainly the very expensive tax. So they're the big ones. And you don't want to lose sight of them because if you need money to run things, you're going to be charging them. Corporation tax is a more emotive tax. Uh, and you have to look at this vis-a-vis -vis what David was saying to you earlier on about how businesses don't really pay taxes. There's been a lot of contro controversy, I think, in recent years about how much business do or don't pay taxes. Any self-respecting business would probably tell you they pay a lot of taxes and they might mention that their employees pay taxes. They might mention to the collect VAT. But what we're looking at here with the corporation tax is a tax on profits. So if they're running a business and they're profitable, they'll pay tax on their profits. Lots of these big businesses that don't pay much tax are not making a lot of profit. They might be selling loads and loads, but they're not doing it very profitably, and that's why they don't pay a lot of corporation tax. Uh, and it's, it's quite emotive, but, but it doesn't collect a lot. And we have to look at corporation tax, because remember David said a minute ago that there were different ways of working. You could be an employee, you could be self-employed, or perfectly legitimately, I might prefer to be the managing director of my own company. In which case, I'd set up a little company and put my business in it. And if that's the case, I'd be paying corporation tax. <coughs> and you need to look at how the, the taxes play across those so that you get a balance, because we haven't got a balance just now. Well, assuming that you want a balance, but I think I would agree with the Murley's report <coughs> that you don't want differentials. And I'll come back to them. Capital gains tax, you might want to tax wealth. That's a, a tax on, on gains. So whatever profit you make out of selling something that's capital in nature, if I sold my business, if I sold a rental property and it made a gain, CGT. Now, as you can see, it's small beer in the grand scheme of things. And you might also ask why that's the way of it and whether you should be charging more. Uh, it's a moot point because what's the property that most people own or their capital? It's their houses. And I put it to you that it's usually quite emotive if you suggest that you're going to get taxed on your own home. It's not what everybody likes. I haven't even mentioned inheritance tax here because that's even smaller beer. It's everybody's favourite bogeyman. Lots of people worry about IHT, inheritance tax, but you don't actually many have, find many people pay it at all. It's about 6% of estates across the UK. So it's, it's a very small amount. And inheritance tax, wrongly named. It's a tax on your estate when you die, not what you inherit. And then down the bottom here, I apologise for the acronyms. Once we start hitting property taxes, you find that these are devolved and that you get different taxes in different jurisdictions across the UK. And interestingly, they're all much of a muchness, but they all have different names and they all have slightly different rules around them. So stamp duty land tax in England, land and buildings transaction tax in Scotland, and the land tax in Wales. Park them just now, and we'll come back to them when we look at Scottish taxes. Scottish taxes, there's different ways of looking at them. We can look at the chronology of them. When the Scottish Parliament was set up in 1998, council tax and business rates, they're local taxes, as David Bell mentioned to us this morning, uh, and they've always sat in, in, in the remit of Scotland since the Parliament was set up. Issues for you to consider. Should you be given money as a parliament and just spend it? Or is it a bit like giving the kids pocket money? Should you be accountable for what you have to spend, i.e. raise your own taxes? And these questions continue to percolate through. So the Calman Commission looked at this. Should we have more powers? 
A Scottish rate of income tax was brought in, and then some of these smaller transaction taxes, the LBTT, the land and buildings transaction tax, and the landfill tax. VAT is a bit of a hornet's nest. I'll come back to that. So you can look at it in chronological terms. I said to you at the outset that one of the things that's really interesting about the package of taxes... Sorry. What's the landfill tax? Landfill tax. Landfill tax is an environmental tax. It's a bit like what it says in its name to the extent that, you know, when you've got rubbish and you tip it into <coughs> landfill sites, then the, the people putting it in the landfill sites have to pay a, an amount of money depending on the type of waste it is. And it's not really designed to raise money. It's designed to stop you from filling landfill sites. And in fact, if you look at the budgets, they're, they're designed to go right down to zero because we're not meant to be chucking stuff in the land in the next few years. So it's not a money raiser. It's a please behave differently tax. Uh, yes, it's an interesting one. And so, so that's, that's one of the ones that we have that's completely devolved. Coming back to these, we've got three different types of devolved taxes. They're fundamentally different. They've got different powers <coughs> attaching to them, and it means that you can do different things with them. If I could perhaps start in the middle with those fully devolved taxes. Fully devolved land and buildings transaction tax, landfill tax. The rules there, Westminster said, you can raise your own taxes. We're going to stop raising the equivalent in England, in Scotland. We're going to switch it off in Scotland. You can do what you like. Scottish Parliament, you can not tax. You can invent your own tax. You can replicate something similar. So Scotland, the Scottish Parliament has complete and total power over those. But they tend to be small beer uh, with the best will in the world. You don't make a lot of money out of land and buildings transaction tax. And as we've just discussed with the landfill, you're meant to get less and less as time goes by. So you've got that. We've also got partially devolved taxes. So something like income tax, which I mentioned to you earlier, it's a UK tax. <laughs> and over the course of the years, various powers have been devolved to Scotland, whereby Scotland can now set its own rates and, and the bands of income, which will be taxed at different rates. So really what Scotland's got in its, in its power is how much tax you're going to collect, not what kind of income you charge or when you charge it or who's going to collect it for you, which is largely still done using PYE, pay as you earn. Uh, pay as you earn is a great thing. You wouldn't want to give up on that, I suggest, because businesses collect it for you. Government doesn't have to pay for it, the collection. And it comes off your salaries, your pensions, as you all well know, long before you get the money in your hand. So it's easy to collect, and it brings cash flow in for the government up front. You'd want to retain PUYE, which is why Scottish income tax only has the how much devolved, not the full shebang. And it's maybe a system you'd want to keep. Something similar in Northern Ireland, just as a kind of comment, on corporation tax rates, although that's not actually been implemented yet. And the other thing that I want to mention very briefly around the partially devolved income tax is that there is one element that you don't have in your control here in Scotland, which I think is crucial, and that's the personal allowance. You know how everybody has a certain amount of income they can earn before they're taxed, the personal <coughs> allowance, set this year at £12,500. That's how much we've got. That personal allowance is set by Westminster for the whole of the UK. So Scotland can only tax beyond that. Now, why do I think it's crucial? Because if you look at any of the budget statistics, you find that in Scotland, 45% of our population of adults do not pay any income tax. Why is that? It's because of an income of less than 12,500. And the other side of that, in terms of wider planning, is that there's not that many people to tax in Scotland. Average wages are about 25, 26,000 a year. So again, what have you got? You've got 9% of the population will pay tax at 41% and upwards. There's not a lot of room to manoeuvre. So maybe if I summarise what I've just been telling you, uh, as one of my colleagues has, has kindly put this slide up for me, the pizza. Who gets which slice? And how do you set the rules? It's a mixture, and it's quite a complicated mixture. And in that complication of the mixtures, some of the levers get a bit restricted. 
So what are we looking at? We're looking at some UK institutions that work with UK taxes, and they also collect the Scottish income tax on behalf of the government. So again, you have to work with HMRC uh, and, and that side of the government in order to collect money. They collect the Welsh rates of income tax too. Uh, so we, we have to be mindful of that. And in Scotland, we've got various new institutions which are up and running and beginning to find their, their feet. What have we got? The Scottish Government is responsible for devolved tax policy. In large part, quite a bit of that sits around things like land and buildings transaction tax because it's fully devolved. Uh, they can't do so much with the income tax. Why can't they do so much with the income tax? You stop and think about it. We were just talking earlier on about some of the, the challenges in income tax uh, for employed, self-employed or businesses. And if you've got rates that slot in and out of that difficulty or tax planning side of things, you can't put Scottish income tax up too much, I would suggest, because otherwise you make people even keener on incorporating. And, and it's, there's nothing wrong with incorporating. Do you know, like, lots of incentives are given to companies, not to individuals. It's a thing that government in, in, in Westminster loses sight of, is that individuals could easily work as self-employed. But it does kind of change the pitch a wee bit. Revenue Scotland, that's our local tax authority. They collect land and buildings transaction tax, landfill tax. The day may come when they also collect air passenger duty and aggregates levy because they are meant to be devolved one day, but we haven't got there yet for reasons uh, which are much to do with state aid uh, and to some extent to do with politics. And then the Scottish Fiscal Commission is a bit like the Office of Budget Responsibility. It, they, they do all the stats and the economic forecasting and, and so on and inform government decisions as to, to where we're going with this. So where are we now uh, in terms of, and that's another thing in, your, in, in terms of what, how you might want to look at tax and what you might or might not raise. Tax is one part of a cog. This morning we were looking at budgets, weren't we? And you need to be mindful that there's the block grant, there's adjustments, there's tax. So there you have tax. The biggest lever is the income tax. If you start changing your income tax, you end up with differences. And as soon as you get differences, some of my colleagues are suitably pleased because, you know, if you want to pay less, if there's a difference, you're going to try and fix it so that you pay less. Who pays Scottish income tax? Scottish taxpayers, who are they? It depends on where you live. Now, if you're rich and you work in London and you maybe have your weekend home here, which is your home? Where are you going to pay tax? There's those kind of considerations and they're not that black and white sometimes. So tax competition, do you want to set low rates to bring business in? Maybe the neighbours are going to do the same and set their rates lower. So you've lost that edge and you've also lost some of the income. Tax competition is the flip side of tax avoidance. It's not always as clever as it looks. And of course, the more you do this, the more it takes me ages to explain it because it's complicated. So <laughs> bear with me. The other thing which David and I, neither of us have properly got to, and we'll maybe come back to in the question and answer session is, is having your own tax powers a good thing? Or actually, do you expose yourself to a lot of risk? There's no guarantee just because you've got the power to raise tax that you're going to make lots of money. People might leave, they might work less, there's all sorts of, or your estimates might be mints as well. You know, there's, there's plenty of options there. Uh, and I think I would like to leave you with two thoughts. This one here, please don't think of tax in isolation because it's there, as we said from the outset, for a purpose in order to help fund what you want to do and make our lives the way we would like them. And I think you need tax and spend to go together. That's the purpose of dev devolving tax powers, and it should be your presentation. You know, if we put this into the kitty, that's what you'll get out, kind of thought process. Uh, anyway, that's just my personal tuppence. Hate me worth. And last but not least, uh, some surveys that the Chartered Institute of Tax have done, and also one of the accountancy firms called Deloitte's. As far as we can make out, uh, I may be in a minority in finding taxes interesting or knowing lots about them. Lots of people know very little. But what was really interesting in the survey that Deloitte's did 
was that there was a straight correlation between what you know and thinking that your taxes are fair in the broad scheme of things and also what you know and being willing to contribute because I think we need more than you know folks who pay more tax and PSI don't want to that type of thing so let me leave you with those as thoughts I'm sorry it was a bit of a kind of run through I'll have to apologize for being late as well and uh, we'll leave it there thank you very much Thanks so much, Charlotte. OK, just a couple of minutes now again, just to digest and reflect, and then we'll be back with the panel. Thanks. Can I bring you room back together? We'll uh, be breaking into our, our breakout rooms after this session, so we'll be able to digest a little bit more what we've heard. So for this session on uh, tax choices, we have three speakers who will provide a range of different perspectives on the choices that can be made in respect of tax to enable Scotland to create a more sustainable society. So David Phillips, who you were, uh, heard from a moment ago, is going to introduce each speaker in turn and let you know when you have a chance to reflect between the sessions. But otherwise, I'll be handing over to David from here. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Russell Gunson. And Russell is the director of the Institute for Public Policy uh, Scotland, IPPR. And IPPR is one of the UK's leading uh, think tanks, which provides research and commentary across a wide range of areas of social and economic policy. Uh, so he's one of our competitors at the IFS. <laughs> um, and what Russell will do is discuss changes to wealth taxes, review of the personal allowance, and changes to VAT, and using local tax powers for their full potential. So over to you, Russell. Thank you very much. And it's, uh 
thank you. It's great to be here. I must say, I love what you're doing here. I think it's amazing. And uh, anything that I can do to support this, I was so chuffed to be invited to help you in your deliberations. So uh, in the session just now, please do interrupt. In the sessions afterwards, um, if you have any questions, just ask. But from lunchtime, it doesn't sound like I need to invite you to do that, because I think you're, you're totally on it. And then the second thing, in driving here through the snow, the blizzards, just to get here on time, unlike the rest of my panel, um, oh. I, uh, <laughs> I, I must admit, I wasn't quite sure if I'd find 120 people completely scintillated by the idea of talking about tax. But I think I have, or at least most of you. So I love talking about tax, and I'm so delighted to find others uh, do too. As David said, I'm Russell Gunton. I'm director of IPPR Scotland. We are a think tank, so what we do, in our view, is take evidence, take ideas, but crucially, come up with solutions. So what I want to talk you through is less about the theory of tax and more about what we think, from our perspective, you could potentially do with tax powers. And I should say, um, we're neutral on the question of independence. Um, you know, we take no view either way on that. But what we're not neutral on is our world view. So we believe in social, economic, and environmental justice. Um, and that's the perspective from which we're coming from. This slide sets out the three main purposes of tax. You can argue there's many more. But the three main purposes of tax from our point of view. So one is to redistribute. You've heard a bit about that already today. To take money from people or businesses who have it. And crucially, to give it um, to others. So it's not just the taking, it's the giving. Secondly, to raise money. Again, you've heard about this. Regardless of who pays it, it's about getting public services um, funded. And then thirdly, to change behaviours. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as we get into the presentation. IPPR have done a great deal of work, both focused in Scotland, but also across the UK, looking at the, the topic of economic justice. Um, across the UK, we held a commission on economic justice that took two years to look at one of the biggest and most fundamental questions facing us since the crash 50, well, 13 years ago and since the Brexit vote a few years ago. How do you rewrite the rules of the economy so that it works for everyone? Because clearly something isn't working just now. And we've also looked very closely in Scotland. So me and my team are based up here, focused totally on Scotland and the powers that are held here and how you can deliver economic justice through the existing powers. And overall, what you find, and again, this is echoed by some of the presentations you've heard already, is that tax is only one part of this. So you have a potentially relatively progressive taxation system in the UK, but we don't have a very fair or equal society. So what's going on underneath that is a very unfair economy. So tax can take money from that economy, but really the fundamental question is how do you get that economy fairer in the first place? So I'm going to talk about how you can do that through tax, but there's lots of things beyond tax that you can do. So you, uh, of course, can set laws. You can change regulation like the minimum wage or the living wage. You can look at employment rights. You can look at the power that workers have versus owners have in the economy. Um, but yes, one of the things you can do is tax. But ultimately, this is all about changing choices. So how do you get employers to pay workers more? How do you get businesses more broadly to give promotions to people? How do you get businesses working so that they can afford to do those things? Those are the big questions that we've certainly focused on. And there are some things you can do through tax um, to help um, push those things too. I was asked to talk a little bit specifically about poverty and inequality. So we've done a great deal of work in Scotland looking at child poverty um, and how you can potentially reduce really high levels of child poverty in Scotland, albeit those child poverty levels are lower than in the rest of the UK. And really, tax can have some role here, um, a big role here. So tax can have some direct impact. So you saw from David's slides earlier that the income tax system is quite progressive. It takes more money from those at the high end than it does at the low end. But you also heard from Charlotte earlier that um, almost half of people in Scotland don't earn enough to be even into the income tax system. So actually, how much of a direct effect tax can have potentially is quite small. 
But one of its greatest impacts it can have is how you spend the money. Um, what do you, that give? You know, the take is one element, but the give in terms of tax and spend can be where you can have a big impact on poverty and inequality. So raising money to spend on public services that prevent or help people that are in poverty, or equally raising money to spend on social security and welfare benefits that can tackle poverty and inequality directly. But increasingly, for us, it's about also how can you use the tax system to change those behaviours, to rewrite the rules of the economy, as I said, so that you can um, absolutely get those uh, equalities uh, built straight into the economy right away rather than uh, sort of making up uh, for inequality in the first place. To give you an idea, um, we are currently in the midst of uh, a, a sort of stagnation is the big posh word, but the stalling of living standards in the UK. We have never faced something like this for more than um, 200 years. So living standards are only just now slightly higher on average than they were at the time of the crash. We never ever had anything like that happen. So in our view, we're in the midst of an economic emergency that we're just getting used to. So for us, how do you snap the economy out of that and how can tax help to do that is one of the big questions we face. Um, in terms of, you've seen some of this from uh, David's slide, but across the UK, we don't tax as much as other countries. So we tax around a third, um, so tax uh, a third of our economy. The average for comparable European countries, so we looked at a, few, a smaller number than David did, is around 42%. And so the gap between those, if we, if we were increasing taxes to the same level as those other countries, would be around, actually quite far beyond, but certainly over £100 billion a year. And as David said, we get less tax from uh, those in the middle and those at the low end in terms of employee taxes, and we get less tax than our competitors in terms of business taxation. So they, those may be areas that you wish to look at if you were looking at starting from scratch in terms of our tax system. What we wanted to do, so as I say, as a think tank, we're focused on solutions. Um, and so what I wanted to do was talk you through some of the things as we see it that you could do um, to begin to address some of the things that you've heard today. So imagine at the UK level, or imagine a Scotland with all the powers um, it could have, for us, we're really interested in the idea of increasing corporation tax up to the average level for the big countries that we compete with. We've got much lower levels of corporation tax, which is the tax on profits, than they do. And they've been dropping quite significantly. In doing so, we think, could raise around £13 billion a year. So you can see how this is beginning to get us towards that £100 billion. Um, and in terms of the idea of profits being shifted, there are things you could do about that. So you could put a minimum tax level in to ensure that companies pay at least a minimum level if even they shift all of their profits abroad. You could merge national insurance, you've heard about, and income tax, and rearrange um, the pattern of tax so that you could raise more money. Crucially, from wealth, so you've heard about wealth, I think, a little today already, but income from wealth, so whether it's from the savings that you have, um, or whether it's from shares that you have, income from those sources are taxed at a much lower rate than income from earnings, which doesn't seem at all fair. Um, so why would you not increase those taxes to equal? And for us, we'd replace the inheritance tax um, with a gift tax, so a lifetime's gift tax. So rather than charging people at the point at which their estate is um, distributed, Instead, you would charge the recipients on the basis of gifts that they're given. So we would suggest over £125,000. Now, crucially, as well as what we tax, we should also think about what we don't tax. So you've heard about the personal allowance, that first £12,500 that people can earn before they pay any income tax. But there's lots of these types of allowances in the tax system, and they're really, really expensive. So the personal allowance itself was um, worth around £100 billion a year. Um, VAT, you've got lower rates on energy, you've got zero rates on some things like books and food and clothes. Those cost tens of billions of pounds a year. And these are throughout the tax system. Now, the, the clumsy thing is that some of them are designed to help the poorest. So food, for example, let's not charge VAT on it because the poorest wouldn't be able to afford to eat. 
But actually, there's probably much more efficient ways to help those people than trying to use VAT um, or some of the other allowances to do so. So those might be places to look to raise really significant amounts of money um, in a way that potentially, if you spend it right, could help people more. Um, I'm going to go over just slightly, but I, I will bring it to an end in a second. But looking at the Scotland level power, so what's devolved just now? So again, we've done a great deal of work looking at what you could do. We could get into more detail on that in the breakout sessions. But firstly, you can use those income tax powers. They're quite restricted in the ways that Charlotte said. But you can use them certainly to protect levels of public spending. Um, so if you want to end austerity, income tax raises lots of money, and it might be a good way to do it. And it's certainly the one that the Scottish Government has used to now. But to go beyond that, to do some of the more interesting things, given we all care about tax in this room, around green taxes, around wealth, around inheritance tax or gift taxes, you're very likely to look... Oh, sorry, there's a hand up. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. What is the inheritance tax thing? So the inheritance tax is the one that Charlotte mentioned in her ah, presentation. So it's... So we, we propose the gift tax above 125,000 charge, pretty much like income tax. So you'd pay your income tax and it would go up um, progressively from there. Inheritance tax is paid currently on around about 375, I think it is, um, threshold, 40% tax above that. You can also um, give your partner that level of tax. So actually it can be up to about a million pounds before you pay any inheritance tax just now. So very small proportions of people who have died pay inheritance tax in Scotland. Um, but to use your local tax powers, you could do more uh, imaginative things. So you could introduce the carbon tax in Scotland, an inheritance tax, a gift tax, and you could look at some of the local taxes that currently exist, uh, where we give rebates, including to, to small businesses, and look at how you could change those to affect the behaviour you wish to. So if, as with all the other speakers, I've skipped through at the end because I've run out of time. But um, we, <laughs> the takeaway I will leave there, I won't talk through, but we can get into much more depth in the discussions. Thank you ever so much. Great. Thanks, Russell. Uh, so I was asked initially to talk about two minutes, kind of bringing things together from the different presentations. But what I'll do is maybe just spend about 30 seconds doing that, just linking these two together. And I think what Russell did, he sort of echoed some of the themes we heard in the kind of talks by myself and by Charlotte, that you need to think about how the system as a whole fits together, not just taxes, but also what the money could be spent on as well. So how sometimes get the money in, say maybe through VAT, and you can help people better through the kind of public services and the kind of benefits and other things that they can, they can access. And I think uh, Russell also kind of uh, raised the point about how compared to our European neighbours, we tend to be quite a low tax country. I said, I said, what I said as well is that compared to some of our English speaking sort of countries, we're slightly higher tax. So there's kind of a question about kind of what kind of country you want to be. More European country or more like our English speaking kind of uh, Australia, New Zealand, America. Um, so I think there's kind of a real question there. Um, okay, great. So let me just fish this out. Um, I think you now have two or three minutes to uh, write down some uh, thoughts, questions for later on, and then we'll go on to our next speaker, who's going to be uh, Laurie McFarlane.
So, uh, our next speaker is Laurie Mc McFallen. Uh, Laurie is a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London and a Fellow of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And prior to this, Laurie was a Senior Economist at the New Economics Foundation, another competitor of ours. <laughs> um, now, Laurie will consider how taxes can be used to change behaviour and support public policy. Um, and talk about particularly incentive and disincentive taxes. These will include taxes which aim to reduce social and environmental harms, which address market failures and externalities, and which support positive economic behaviour. And he will highlight taxes that have been successful and others that could be introduced and talk about the purpose they could be for. So, lobby. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a, a great pleasure to be, uh, be able to be part of this. I'll also start just with a quick apology, which is that I need to shoot off straight after this, sadly. I would love to say. Um, but uh, I'm sure my colleagues here who are, who are on the panel will be more than capable of answering uh, any questions you have on what I'm about to say. Okay, so... As we've heard already, tax serves a number of different purposes in the economy. So to provide uh, the government with revenue for government spending, to redistribute income and wealth, to help smooth fluctuations in the economy. So the economy tends to be quite volatile. We have booms and busts. Tax can help to dampen that. To support growth, employment and industrial policy. But in this presentation, I'm going to focus on two specific areas, and that's to address market failures and externalities, and that's two terms I'll come on to just define in a minute, and to influence broader behaviour, both individuals and firms, and to support wider public policy objectives. First, just some uh, basic context, um, which is the tax system in this country and in the UK has been developed over many decades, indeed centuries, uh, and it's left it uh, quite complicated with some quite kind of perverse incentives that don't necessarily align with what we're talking about, with what a society we should be striving for in the 21st century. So when we're thinking about this in terms of behaviours, it's important just to think about what are the challenges and opportunities that we want to think about in the 21st century, which I know is exactly what you've been doing throughout this process. So just bear that in mind. So firstly, market failures. So this sounds like a, a technical term, and it's a term that economists like to use quite a lot. And all it means is instances where if you leave something to markets to do, it will lead to a suboptimal outcome. So markets don't really do them very well without the government intervening to do something. Now, there are lots of different examples, some on the screen. I'm not going into too many details. One is a monopoly. There are some sectors that are naturally a monopoly, like water provision, for example. You only have one set of pipes going through. That's a market failure. The one that I want to talk about, though, is one called externalities, and in particular, negative externalities. And this is when certain activities give rise to social or environmental bads that are imposed on third parties who are not responsible for that bad. So, for example, you could have a car factory producing cars and spewing out pollution into a river and selling these cars to its customers, maybe even in a different country. But the cost of that pollution isn't borne by the car producer, it's borne by the communities that live further downstream who are getting dirty water. So externalities are when prices in the economy don't reflect their true social and environmental cost. And without government doing something, this will lead to an excess of harmful activity. In this example, more pollution in the rivers. So what can we do about this? And this is where taxes come in. So there's something called Pigovian taxes. Now, don't be put off by that. It's just a technical term, again, that economists use. It's named after the economists who came up with it. They like to name things uh, after themselves. Um, but basically what it means is taxes that correct for this mispricing. So it's levying a tax to make those who are responsible for the bads actually pay for them. So in the example that I just gave, it'd be levying a tax on the pollution for the car uh, manufacturer so that they would have a cost associated with that pollution and it would also incentivise them to pollute less because they would have to pay for it. And so there are some examples of these that we already have today. I'm going to go through a couple of these. These are by no means extensive. 
But before I do, I should just highlight that all the ones that I'm going to mention in this presentation, most of them don't really raise that much money. As we've seen already, the big money comes from things like income tax, corporation tax and other things. Most of these don't raise that much. It's not really about raising lots of money. We've already heard about the landfill tax, and this is one that is actually devolved to Scotland. And this is a tax on anyone disposing of waste at a landfill site. And it's been pretty successful, actually, at reducing the amount of waste going in to the landfill. Vehicle excise duty, this is something that many of you will pay. It's a tax levied on any vehicle on the road. But what's interesting about it is that it's linked to how fuel efficient your car is. So if you've got a, very, a car that emits hardly any emissions, you'll pay less. If you've got a big gas guzzling car, you'll pay more. We've also, of course, got fuel duties, which is already heard, which is a tax on petrol and diesel. And that does actually raise a not, not too insignificant sum of money. We've got the climate change levy, and this sounds grand, um, but actually it's really a tax uh, basically on energy delivered to uh, businesses, um, certain businesses. Um, and the aim is to try and encourage them to be more energy efficient and, and more uh, emit less carbon. But in practice, it's relatively small, uh, and it doesn't, indeed, it doesn't raise that much money, and indeed, uh, some would argue it's not that effective. So what about the future? Now, these are not necessarily my, uh, my favourite options. These are just some that are in the discourse today. So a carbon tax, um, this is a tax which imposes a tax on uh, every unit of, for example, CO2 emissions. Um, and the, the, exam the corollary here would be the example of the pollution in the factory, I said. A carbon tax would, lo would levy a tax on every unit of carbon that is emitted. Now, there's generally quite a wide degree of consensus that a carbon tax would be a pretty good idea and could do a lot to help us reduce carbon emissions by making carbon emitters pay for it. Plastic packaging tax. Um, now, plastic's become a big issue in recent years, um, and Scotland actually pioneered the use of the plastic bag charge, which has been rolled out across Britain. But this isn't strictly a tax, uh, because the revenues that are raised from this are actually kept by the retailers. They don't go to government, although they generally donate them to charity. The UK government at the moment has said that it's looking at a tax on plastic packaging, on all packaging that doesn't include at least 30% of recycled material. Um, so this is something that we might, may well see on the horizon. A meat tax. Um, so now it's now widely recognised that meat, and in particular beef, is a major contributor to, to CO2 emissions and other environmental harms. This has led some to call for some kind of tax on meat so that prices reflect that, as I say, environmental cost, something that the Committee on Climate Change actually mentioned uh, recently. Sin taxes. Now, this is a, a similar type of tax, but it generally tends to be a tax levied on certain goods or services that are deemed to be socially harmful to society and individuals. So you recognise many of these taxes on alcohol and tobacco. They actually raise not too, about a billion pounds each uh, in Scotland, roughly. The sugar tax, you might remember this was introduced on soft drinks. You might remember Iron Brew cut down the sugar, how that caused an uproar in Scotland. That was because of that. And also levies on gambling as well. So what about the future? Again, here's just some things to, to think about. These aren't necessarily my uh, ideas, but the things that have been discussed. So frequent flyer levy. You might re recognize the term fly scam, I think it's called, which is flight shame. Um, and this is basically uh, re the recognition that Flying lots and lots and lots is being increasingly recognised to be harmful. And 70% of UK flights today are taken by only 15% of the population. It's generally wealthier people who take all these flights. So a frequent flyer levy would be everyone gets one tax-free flight, but with every additional flight you take, you pay a higher rate of tax on and on and on. Potentially illegal substances, presently illegal, sorry. The reason I mention this, although it sounds a bit controversial, <laughs> It's simply because in many places around the world today, some US states, some uh, other countries around the world, are starting to take their approach with certain things like marijuana to rather than make them legal, to regulate them and tax them. And this is leading to actually not insignificant amounts of tax revenue coming in in some places. And this a trend, I say, might continue in the years to come. A vape tax. In recent years, we've seen a big shift away from cigarettes, people smoking less cigarettes, smoking e-cigarettes, smoking vape devices, which are taxed not like cigarettes. There's now a debate to say, well, should they be taxed uh, differently now as well? Now, not to get into whether that's a good or bad idea, it's just to highlight that as consumption patterns in society shift, we may need to respond with our tax system to shift as well. Just some final points here, just to, just to kind of bear in mind 
There is also the, the opportunity to use the tax system to promote other public policy objectives, not necessarily market failures, not necessarily sin taxes. One example here, I've got prevent extreme concentrations of wealth by looking at inheritance and other passive unearned forms of income. We've already heard today inheritance that actually hardly anyone pays it. It's not something that most people pay, but nonetheless there is significant wealth being passed through the generations today that is going untaxed. Maybe we should do something about that. Encourage reuse, repair and recycle, a kind of circular economy approach. Oh, can we use the tax system to encourage people to get things repaired rather than going out and buying brand new stuff all the time? Maybe we can. Discourage potentially destabilising financial sector activity through a financial transactions tax. This was it talked about a lot of the financial crisis. This super fast trading that happens can be destabilising. Maybe a levy on each transaction would dis discourage that. Or promoting long term saving and investment and penalise short termism. We already have tax incentives for saving through things like ISA accounts, some of you might have. Um, are there other ways we could do that? The final point I just want to finish on is that when thinking about these kinds of taxes, we should always consider the distributional impacts and the potential unintended consequences. Now, we're absolutely right when we heard earlier, not every tax needs to be progressive, what matters is the system as a whole. But we need to think what the consequences could be if you introduce some things that actually are very regressive, and indeed other unintentional consequences. A good example of this is the yellow vests in France. You may remember the protesters in France, I think they're still going. Now, what initially gave rise to that was that the President of France tried to introduce increased fuel duties. Now, we might think that's a good idea from an environmental point of view, and that's probably what he thought. What he didn't realise is that many workers in France thought it's hitting them far too hard, and that led to them to take to the streets and really caused a, an issue. So think through carefully, not just whether they're a good idea on their own terms, but what could be the consequences, where does the burden lie? Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, so just very quickly, I think, again, kind of common themes coming out from the different presentations. So if you remember my presentation, I said that, in general, economists think you shouldn't be taxing things differently because doing that causes distortions and can kind of reduce revenues. But Lori pointed out and highlighted areas where, because there's very good reasons to have different taxes on different items, so things that are polluting or things that cause social harm, Maybe that's something to think about when thinking about how you can you redesign and improve the Scottish tax system. Now, I think the last point that Lloyd made as well is also really important. In doing this, it's important to be kind of very careful in thinking about the designs and in thinking about not only who might you be affecting, so if you have more taxes on uh, fuel or on pollution, will that actually raise costs for poorer people? Um, not only that, but also thinking, could you have other unintended effects of, of, of taxes as well? So actually, when thinking about these areas of tax, I think kind of Lobby's last point, thinking about you know, the costs and the benefits of them, I think is a really important point. Um, so again, another couple of minutes to have a little kind of think and write things down, and then we'll move on to our final presenter.
again with our final speaker. Um, so our final speaker is Ewan MacDonald Russell, and he's from the Scottish Retail Consortium. So Ewan is the head of policy and external affairs at the Retail Consortium, which is a representative body for uh, retail companies in Scotland, so, so shops. Um, Ewan will consider tax from a business perspective. Uh, that will focus on what businesses consider where the focus should be on uh, revenue maximization and where it's about creating positive incentives for businesses and people. He'll then explore that through examining the distinction between personal and business taxation, uh, considering both uh, direct taxes, so taxes like income tax, and indirect taxes, so things like VAT. And that will include encouraging the right behaviors, creating and supporting uh, competitive markets and fair markets, and ensuring good businesses are competing on a level playing field. Um, so, without further ado, Ewan. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Um, I must confess, I feel a little bit like a slightly charlatan here because everyone else is a real economist with lots of background. I'm actually a public policy lobbyist. My job is to argue on behalf of all the Scottish shops for the best political culture. So that's my health warning at the start here. I argue on behalf of businesses. I'm giving a business point of view. Other views are available from other people. <laughs> I want to talk about three things today. I want to talk about why businesses are actually relatively okay with tax, what we think tax is valuable for, relatively briefly, but I want to just sort of disabuse the myth that we hate all taxes and don't want to pay any. I want to talk then about how we set up and what principles are good and how we shape a really strong tax system, what, what the things work through those examples mentioned. And at the end, just a little bit about some of the societal things. I'll try and pick up on one or two things other people have said. There's some really fascinating examples and, and I'll try and give our point of view on that. But kind of starting off on, on what's the, the point of tax, um, I've just used pretty pictures, um, but they're kind of laying out three areas where taxation is really valuable to businesses. The first is infrastructure. We need roads, we need trains, we need customers to come to our shops, we need to be able to deliver the goods to the back of the store, and only the state can do that. The state builds and manages those for us, so we have to pay tax in order for our businesses to work at all. The second one is kind of skills, training, people coming through skills, apprenticeships and support for our workers so we have better, more productive workers. Again, the government is the best way for that to be done centrally and to provide support to make sure all businesses can do it. The very largest businesses often will do their own skills work, but that doesn't matter. You need to get great graduates, the best people. So that's really valuable. And the third, which is the kind of nice police Scotland thing, is, is all the other services that our stores or our colleagues or everybody else relies on. We need police officers to stop people stealing stuff from our stores. We need a wonderful health service to look after colleagues and their families. So, so these things are really, really valuable to us. Um, in terms of, you know, the kind of what we look about tax, I, I'm, I'm going to use a lot simpler example than everyone else. Um, it's about go the Goldilocks principle, which is the idea that you can have taxation in, in sort of three levels. If it's too high or if the porridge is too hot, you've got a problem for us because what that means is that the revenue coming into the business changes, the amount of money the business is changing, and that forces it to do certain things that may not be desirable. And, and as, as was kind of outlined by David rather nicely earlier, the business itself is a collection of people and interests. So they will respond to higher costs in different ways. Like we see it in the retail industry at the moment. We see when the costs and businesses go up, the businesses look at it, that might mean that they can't raise wages. It might mean they close down stores or they don't invest. It might mean that they don't generate revenue or generate things. And that's, that's bad in itself for that business, those workers. It can be bad for customers. And we know that the recent challenges of public policy have seen food prices go up by about 2% year on year since the uh, 2016 referendum. So we see that these things have an impact. Conversely, though, obviously, if, price, if taxation is too low, we don't have the revenue generated for government for all the things we need. It means that people more generally don't have enough money, in our case, to go and spend money in the shops. We want them to spend it in the shops. We can spend it in other things, but shops will be good. Um, so that's really, you know, those are the two sides. So when we think about tax, it's not a kind of moral view of tax should always be super low or we're ambivalent about it. There's that sort of principle there about it needs to be in that kind of right spot in which it's raising as much money as possible and your rates are set to get that, but at the same time you're not disadvantaging it. And there's a second principle as well, and that's a little bit about fairness. And I, I'm not looking, talking about fairness in the way that, that Russell was. They're both the same word being used differently. In our case, it's about creating competitive markets. The retail industry broadly is a pretty good market. We have lots and lots of competition. If you want to buy your groceries, you've got 10, 15, sorry. Am I speaking too quickly? <laughs> 
So you've got lots of different people competing, and that's because you have a good playing field where you have lots of different businesses able to work. That doesn't always happen. And when you don't have those markets, or where you have a situation we see, and, and I'm going to kind of talk about that in the, in the bottom example here, which is a nice picture of a high street, to talk about direct taxation and business taxation. Um, my members uh, are very obsessed with business rates, um, which is the most boring of all the taxes. Um, business, we pay about 22% of business rates uh, for a sector that's about 7% of the economy. And that's just because we tend to have lots of shops, and those take up lots of property. Property, as, as is outlined, is a great thing to tax because it's really hard to move your shop, except, of course, that generally markets respond to incentives. One of the things you'll see, particularly in the retail industry, is that it is an awful lot cheaper to operate a single warehouse and operate online than it is to operate from multiple stores. Now, I'm not making a, a comment against that, and indeed most of my members operate both online and from store, so it's not clean. But I'd say that what you have to be careful when you create incentives. If you create incentives where we have a tax rate for the very biggest shops or biggest properties in Scotland, slightly higher than that in England. We would probably argue that that's the case, that that's going to make it easier for a business operating across the UK to invest in perhaps the north of England in Sunderland rather than in East Kilbride because it might be more efficient for them. That might or might not be the case, and there's lots of other factors. Tax competition is something that our members would look at closely when they're making investment decisions, and they look at the direction of travel on taxation. Are taxes broadly going up? Are they stable? Are they sort of very volatile? And very volatile or going up are both disincentives to investment. Stability is quite good. We, you know, we sort of accept that sort of thing. To talk about the, the two other examples, um, first one on, on income tax. We, we come from a probably a slightly different perspective from some business groups. I'm just speaking for retail here. Um, where we look at the kind of way the Scottish government's done income tax, and we're quite supportive, actually, of a, a progressive system. Um, we don't think people on very high incomes are going to change their shopping patterns depending on their income tax bill. We think they'll probably buy what they will. We would probably argue, and maybe there's a bit of a, a distinction here um, with some of the other speakers, that actually if people are paying less tax and they're on relatively low incomes, so that's not lower middle things, they're likely to keep spending that money. And by spending that money, whether it's through shops, whether it's going to, to the pub, whatever they do with it, that's actually generating economic activity. That's helping people in those jobs. It's helping people further up the supply chain. You get this uh, thing around the multiplier effect that the certain bit of economic activity generates more, and all of that's taxed at different points. So there's just that element of how you encourage that economic growth. We've not spoken hugely about growing the economy today. That's something we feel quite strongly about because we would always hope that if you've got a growing economy, that's going to generate more tax revenue for the economy, and that's generally then going to help you. I'm using generally a lot here. There are huge things I'm skipping over, and there's lots of counterpoints in some of that too. Um, I'm kind of moving on to the final one, and this is really interesting on, on indirect taxation. And we've had some some really interesting examples. It's something we come across quite a lot from retail because we're often the people who are passing on indirect taxes. Um, you know, we were talking about, uh, as I mentioned, the plastics tax there, but that's actually one of about five different environmental taxes. And I'd say when you're coming into this area, businesses particularly are looking for clarity and a little bit of coordination. What we find very hard is when we get multiple taxes on multiple policies that actually require us to do different things. So balancing that's quite hard. Government finds that very difficult. We know that um, in Scotland there is a case where we're very keen to support the Scottish food and drink industry. We should. It's a fantastic industry. But there's also a challenge that we want Scottish people to broadly be losing a little bit of weight and not eating so many unhealthy products. The tension is that we make an awful lot of brilliant, very unhealthy products in Scotland. So on one hand, we're subsidising unhealthy companies. On the other hand, we're, we're charging them. That's really difficult to reconcile, and I don't, I'm, I'm being glib. So these are things. When we look at VAT, you know, we, you know, VAT is quite straightforward, but some of the exemptions, I'd say actually it's quite positive that we pick certain things that are valuable as a society. But there is that case of the more exemptions we come in with, the more complicated we make it. The same, uh, I'm sort of jumping back slightly to business rates tax, but business rates is immensely complex because there's about 50 different types of exemptions and something like a third, a quarter of the business rates bill is used paying for the reliefs within the system. It's incredibly inefficient and that inefficiency is just a dreg, dead weight on the economy. Um, so I guess kind of to, to vaguely try and bring this to a, to a close here, there's lots of individual things, and hopefully I'm very happy to pick up on things like minimum unit pricing, on carrier bag charging. I, I help do loads of work on carrier bag charging. It's one of the few things I'm happy about. Um, there's loads of those sort of areas where it's fine, but 
But to finish, you know, we think that probably what you're looking for is a system that is a little bit fairer. I think there's a risk that putting charges onto business can sometimes seem like an easy option. The reality is they get passed on to customers or to workers in different ways. And I think it's just reflecting on how they're likely to do it and what that looks like. That's probably the thing. That's not always a bad thing. Um, putting up taxes on cigarettes or even on alcohol is probably quite a reasonable thing for public health. There's lots of evidence on the minimum unit pricing that increasing the cost, even though that's regressive and it puts it up for people who are the worst off, the health benefits will accrue to people from those communities massively outweigh that cost. That's a totally reasonable way to do public policy, just making sure the evidence base is there and it's around it. So, so I think as a kind of finishing thing, it, when you're setting kind of tax policy, it being open, simple, and creating those good markets that, that deliver for consumers and deliver the growth that provide revenue for government as well. Thank you. Great, thanks Ewan. So Ewan highlighted that tax involves uh, a trade-off. Just like Goldilocks's porridge, uh, it can be too hot uh, or too cold, and it's unappetizing. Um, so as I think that again links back to what we talked about kind of right at the start of the session, that there's no one right amount of tax. It's not a kind of golden rule sort of given down. It's about thinking of two things. One is what is your values? What do you want to achieve as a country? And then thinking about, well, what are some of the costs of tax? How might it kind of discourage work? How might it discourage investment? How might it, you know, have some negative effects? And finding the right balance. And I think that is, that is kind of where the discussions, I think, I hope, will go over the next rest of this day and into tomorrow. How do you get that balance right? Level of tax and the different kinds of tax. So you're reflecting the values you want for Scotland, but also taking into account the sort of knock-on effects that tax can have as well. And we now go straight into the break. Yes. <laughs>